All right, welcome back in here to Live Now from Fox. I am Andy Mack. Of course, we are entering hurricane season, but let's talk about another impressive weather phenomenon at an altitude just a little bit higher than some of those clouds. And I'm talking about the northern lights. And of course, what a very fascinating kind of phenomenon that is as the northern lights may return to the night sky over Canada and parts of the United States as this eruption from the sun no, occurred over the weekend, expected to impact Earth magnetic field late Monday into Tuesday and if you're in this path you might have a chance to see it this coming in from the National Weather Service in Indianapolis you can see some of those uh, locations there Montana South Dakota Minnesota some of Wisconsin impacted by this let's be joined right now by Robert Steenberg talking about this with the NOAA Space Weather Prediction Center thank you so much for joining us here on live now from Fox and it's so cool if you ever get a chance to see the northern lights how would you describe what it is and what it looks like well i can tell you the uh the northern lights are just an amazing thing to witness and they're the only visible uh manifestation of space weather so they're the only real visible way to know space weather is happening and uh you get a multitude of colors um, across the sky and those colors are driven by uh, reactions that occur between particles that are streaming into our upper atmosphere and interacting with the atmospheric constituents. And you can get reds and purples and greens and all sorts of stuff. Yeah, and it's so very cool. And these are just some of the images of potentially what people might get a glimpse of. And you mentioned some of how this happens, but Robert, walk us through it. People are obviously not as uh, understanding, doesn't have a great understanding like you do. Can you kind of simplify it for us? The electric man magnetic field is so much involved. Oh, yeah. Explain how this exactly comes to be. Okay, well, it all begins with the sun. Yep. Uh, the sun has an outer atmosphere we call the corona. It's composed of uh, plasma, and you can think of plasma as things like fire or lightning or, or what you find in fluorescent light bulbs. But anyhow, this matter gets ejected from the sun, and it comes to Earth over the course of hours to days. It impacts Earth's magnetic field, so Earth has a magnetic field, and this thing carries its own magnetic field, and they interact, and they drive what's called a geomagnetic storm. Um, this one, in fact, got here about um, 10 minutes before this interview started, so your timing was impeccable. It arrived at the satellite about a million miles from Earth, and we saw it, and then we saw it arrive at Earth, and then I'm on the air. <laughs> so is, it's amazing. That's exactly what we were timing up. That's just exactly why I'm on right <laughs> in line with what the sun is talking about. Uh, and we talk about it kind of dipping down into the United States. And I do want to put up this post again here on Live Now from Fox of exactly where you might see it. Why is it so low? Why is the United States kind of in the right place, the right time to see so many? How many of the northern states will be invisible? Well, a lot of things are lining up tonight. So it's, it's uh, later in the day. So we're going to be moving into nightfall, which obviously you need to be able to see it. Um, the strength of the storm we imagined was going to be enough to drive it further south because normally it lives up in Canada and Alaska. Uh, and the stronger the storm, the further south it's driven in the northern hemisphere, so towards the equator. They're see, you know, they'll be able to see the same thing in the southern hemisphere as it drives it towards the equator uh, down there. Uh, and yeah, you've got some beautiful shots of aurora uh, from the past. So I would encourage folks to go outside. You could see in that diagram you had uh, that it would be dipping down into, you know, you could say Ohio and uh, Iowa. Uh, each storm is different. Uh, they un they unfold differently. So uh, my advice to folks is uh, if you think there's a chance, go out and take a look. Um, you want to be away from bright lights if you can and uh, no cloud cover. That was going to be my question because sometimes, and I lived in Minnesota for a few years, and you can't be near the city. You have to be a little bit in the outskirts. Can you talk about how that might impact it, how far you might need to go out to really get a good look at it? Well, the, uh, the further away you can get and the darker you can get, the more likely you're going to be to be able to pick it out. Um, and I would tell people, even if you can't see it with the naked eye, um, you can use uh, your cell phone to take pictures. And sometimes because the, the range is larger uh, in the cell phone of what it can detect, 
uh, you'll actually be able to see it in cell phone pictures. So for instance, I live in town and I was in my backyard for the storm in May of last year, and I was able to see the aurora and get a good picture of it, um, even with the light pollution. So, uh, but generally the darker you can get it, the better. Uh, and Robert, when you are looking up at the sky, is there anything that you need to stand out? If you're uncertain, if you're like, hey, is that the Northern Lights? Is that the Aurora Borealis? Is it going to be very apparent or is there something that stands out in particular? Um, it should be relatively apparent. Sometimes we get, we get uh, people submit photos and things that um, for reflection of city lights off of low clouds, for okay. instance, that can, can fool folks. Um, but there's uh, there's several different websites out there where people can post um, their sightings of the aurora. So I always encourage people to you know take a look around and you know monitor social media. You'll see it on there too. All right, very good. And you said obviously that you were able to witness it very recently. In terms of the frequency of the northern lights, is there a specific season? Is it just based on when the sun acts up? Is this? Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Is there anything unusual or common with that factor? Sure, you're you're absolutely right. There is a variation in frequency. Right now, we're uh, kind of coming off the crest of solar maximum, so there's higher frequency, so more opportunities to see it. As we uh, start to sink down into solar minimum, there will still be opportunities, but there'll be fewer and farther between until we eventually hit solar minimum, and then there's no sunspot activity, um, which is a catalyst for a lot of this stuff. And so uh, then there'll be a kind of a drought for a while where you won't see as much, at least at our latitudes. If you go further north, uh, you'll see the aurora. Still, wanna, uh, and, there are other features that can drive it. Yeah, obviously, it's just so fascinating and so because profound to look at it. But I want to ask you, obviously, people potentially concerned about that. This doesn't have any harm to uh, us humans. Is it, is it any factor in terms of the environment either? Uh, no, humans and the environment, uh, we're good. Um, there, are, there are sectors and industries that can be affected depending on the strength of the storm. And part of our role here at NOAA is to keep those folks up to speed on what's happening, what's unfolding in the space environment so that they can take actions to mitigate those impacts. Uh, and you are obviously kind of in this space weather prediction center and it's kind of the same but different than what we're seeing on the ground is it just basically the same kind of formula obviously you have a little bit of a more time in terms of the distance between the sun and earth but can you talk about that it's so, so fascinating that you're able to kind of forecast that if you will yeah it really is amazing and you know we are able to do what we do because of the types of technology that has evolved over the years that allows us to put spacecraft in positions where we can continuously monitor the sun um, where we can see the sun with resolutions and frequency of uh, imagery that is just unparalleled uh, in history so we are the beneficiaries of that and that's what allows us to do what we do we also have numerical modeling like the prediction of the arrival of this thing was created by a numerical model and then honed by a forecaster and and uh, this one was spot on so that's pretty exciting uh, and I've learned so much during this conversation. Is there anything else that I am missing that you want to let our audience know? Any questions uh, that you want to answer that I may have not asked? Um, no, I think he, I think you covered the bulk of it. Um, if folks have questions, they can always visit our website at spaceweather.gov, and uh, you should be able to find answers there. And we have a, a contact us place if you if you want to ask a question. Um, but uh, we love the reports that we hear and uh, we love helping people uh, know about this and, and kind of partake of, like I said, uh, space weather's only visible manifestation. All right, very good. That is just so fascinating. And we all hope to encourage people to get out. Hopefully it's weather cooperating, no overcast nights. You can get out and potentially see it there in the northern United States, seeing some of that impressive aurora borealis. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time here on Live Now. Right, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right. Thanks so much. All right. Great conversation as always. And if you've ever had a chance to see the Northern Lights, please do get out and look at it as this now dips down into the Northern United States. Some 18 states potentially could get a glimpse of it. The Space Weather Prediction Center predicting a G3, a strong geomagnetic storm tonight, which may allow for some Northern Lights to be visible as far south 
as Indiana, mostly clear skies will help create favorable conditions for viewing, but bundle up with temperatures in the 50s. So that's good advice and uh, very interesting. You might need to get outside of the cities if you live in a metropolitan area to really get the full scope of what this is about.